Mehdi Hassan has been one of the few mainstream hosts in the Western world who has put proper scrutiny on Israel's actions in Gaza. That's included highlighting the genocidal statements from Israeli leaders, as he did here. When it comes to quote-unquote intent in the context of the Genocide Convention, listen to what Israeli politicians and generals themselves have said. Cabinet ministers like Yov Gallant, the defense minister, who said Israel was fighting human animals and ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip, no electricity, no food, no fuel. Or energy minister Israel Katz, who said no electrical switch will be turned on in Gaza, no water pump will be opened and no fuel truck will enter until the Israeli abductees are returned home. Or heritage minister Amichai Ilahu, who said blow up and flatten everything in the north of Gaza and give that land to Israeli settlers. And if you think that's bad, just listen to the man in charge of Israel's government and military speaking on Saturday. You must remember what Amalek has done to you, says our Holy Bible, and we do remember and we are fighting. That was Prime Minister Netanyahu invoking a biblical story in which the Israelites were told to exterminate, to literally kill all the men, women and children from an ancient tribe called Amalek. Not a great reference when we're debating accusations of possible genocidal intent, I think we can all agree. So statements like that won't be new to you guys. We've been highlighting this stuff for weeks now. But not many people in the mainstream media have. You don't see many segments like that in the mainstream media on MSNBC, on the BBC here, on, 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 on CNN, for example. Um, Mehdi Hassan has also been an exceptionally tough interviewer. So two weeks ago, he put questions like this to Netanyahu advisor Mark Regev. True, Why I'm did your sure military spokesman on Monday point to a calendar in Arabic and say these are the names of terrorists on them? That's false. Can you accept that here and now? I, 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 I'm not aware of the, uh, the, the incident. Let's put up the so image. We have the image. You have I, no I can't comment. read Arabic. It doesn't help me. I have well, no comment. You, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the does incident. Does your spokesman but, uh, read you, Hang on. I have a question, Maddie. You're a journalist. Have you made a professional mistake ever? Not no, intentionally, I'm, but have you made a professional I'm, I'm, mistake? I'm, exactly, and I own up to it. Have so you can made, you made a mistake? So can, can, not so can you own up to so, the mistake? So now? if I made it, I've made mistakes, you've made mistakes, but there's a difference between making an honest mistake and between Hamas that deliberately exaggerates numbers Unde to suit its propaganda purposes. There's a huge Understood. difference. So it sounds like it's like. It, so it sounds, so it's, hold on, hold on. You said propaganda. Can we just deal with your colleague Ophir Gendelman's tweet? It's still up seven days later. Why has it not come down? It's a Lebanese short film. We can put it on screen. It's not Palestinians faking their own injuries. Can we own up to that mistake and take that down? Is that not propaganda? I, uh, uh, once again, I understand that that was also a mistake. And, so why is it still uh, up seven I'll days speak later? to Offer about it if you like. I'll speak to Offer about it if you like. He's Great. a friend of mine okay. and a colleague. I quite like him. He's a good man. He's actually very effective. Why is he effective? Well, he's he speaks a he's, mother he's tongue level tweet, Arabic. Mark. Mark, I, I agree. He made a mistake. Mark Regev is not the kind of guy who, who usually admits to making mistakes. And, and Mehdi Hassan got him to admit twice there um, that Israel had made mistakes when it came to pushing out fake news. Right? I haven't seen... Many other journalists do that over this period. Obviously, we don't get to interview people like Mark Regev on this show. Those were tough questions. And as I say, forensic interviews like that are all too rare in the mainstream media. Yet, what is Mehdi's reward? Well, he's had his show taken off air. The news was reported in Semaphore magazine, and they write this. Two people familiar with the move, which MSNBC privately announced to staff Thursday morning, told Semaphore that Hassan will become an on-camera analyst and fill-in host. Over the past several years, Hassan became a cult favorite online for his tough interview style and impassioned monologues. But these never translated to rating successes on the weekends or during fill-in appearances on primetime shows. The decision has provoked outrage among progressives. Noura Erekat is a Palestinian human rights lawyer. She said this, MSNBC cancels Mehdi Hassan's show. MSNBC, make this make sense. Mehdi Hassan's program felt like an oasis on air and more needed than ever. His program with Mark Regev was a whole class on journalistic method. He should be amplified, not shut down. And Cenk Yuga from The Young Turk said this, MSNBC cancelled Mehdi Hassan's show because of course they did. It's not just because he treats Muslims as real human beings. It's also because he actually challenges his guests. And that is the biggest heresy in mainstream media. Access must be protected. Um, David, I mean, this is, I mean, to me, seems like an enormous shame. Um, we can probably only infer the reasoning. Um, what do you think has gone on here? 
Well, you know, Michael, as your U.S. American correspondent, I have to say I'm just not at all surprised, and it's it's tough to overestimate the influence of of the Zionist lobby in, in the United States uh, and, and the things that they're able to say and do in the most brazen fashion. Just a few days ago, we had a a fundraiser for the IDF in New York that you know blew up into kind of a big festive party. Uh, I think there were a couple Israeli Jews who came in and protested, and of course were violently removed. But you know, it's very hard to imagine a, a fundraiser for an army. Army uh, that's very what's bragging about you know uh, the slaughter and humiliation of of millions uh, of of people uh, in Gaza and across the West Bank. You know this is a kind of the nature of the of the Israeli exception in, in the United States, and we just have to see this play out in our politics, which is now playing out so dramatically. Uh, you look at a guy like John Fetterman, uh, Senator John Fetterman, who was feted and and promoted by the progressive flank of the Democratic Party for obvious reasons, his working cl- class credentials, taking on the establishment. And then if you read a recent res- investigation, I'm forgetting where it was published, so forgive me for that, um, but you, you you can see how over the course of that campaign, the Democratic majority for Israel, which is of course related to APAC, kind of got its claws into the campaign and basically said, you know, we're going to sink you unless you change your policy on Israel. And now this guy is draping himself in the Israeli flag and has become one of the biggest kind of apologists for the president unfolding genocide in Gaza. Meanwhile, on the steps of the U.S. Capitol, there's a vigil and for, you know, for the ceasefire and and people, you know, trying to speak out about Palestinian uh, plight, and there are like six people holding candles. It's tough to overestimate the extent uh, to which the consensus, the Zionist consensus in the U.S. is uh, not just signed and sealed, but vacuum sealed. You know, it's, it's, it's almost uh, impossible to break. Um, and I think this has to do, it's helpful to get a bit into the weeds, on, it's not that much in the weeds, on, on U.S. politics for just a moment. We are, I think, the only country in the world that has congressional elections every two years. I don't, can you, I mean, obviously there are parliaments that are dissolved and come back and dissolve and come back uh, around the world, but we have fixed congressional terms of two years, which means that our uh, members of U.S. Congress have to run campaigns and be reelected every single two years. Now, of course, those are huge consequences and uh, related to the extent to which we can actually govern the country when you know eighteen and every twenty-four months are spent fundraising and uh, managing a campaign. But it per- it's makes it means that uh, our electoral system at the congressional level is extremely porous. Now. We've seen groups like Justice Democrats come around and take advantage of that porousness through primary processes that can guarantee a voice or a space for progressive politics. Justice Democrats, that's now being wound down in the absence of a sustained source of funding. But it means it's also porous to a mighty uh, hypertrophic APAC that is willing to spend hundreds, literally hundreds of millions of dollars to unseat progressives who are uh, taking a stance uh, against Israel. We're seeing this now um, in the naked brazen offer of $20 million million dollars uh, to, to Nasser, another candidate, to run against Rashida Tlaib, who's been the sole voice to really take on the Zionist lobby in the United States. Um, and, you know, so when we look at the U.S. mainstream media, you know, I think that your tweets said it well. There's another dog that's not barking, which is, you know, p- people taking this question seriously and, you know, interrogating some of the pa- propaganda, lies, um, fabrications that are coming out of uh, the highest levels of the Israeli government and, of course, civil society. Um, but if, if, if we look at the political system and see, we see that lock that uh, APEC and other groups are able to, to exert on the U.S. political system, it shouldn't be any surprise for us that the kind of parasitic uh, mainstream media um, uh, world, which sort of sits like that little shark under the belly of the great big shark, which is the U.S. political system, um, uh, you know, would would be attentive or, you know, cautious or, you know, thinking twice about uh, putting anyone who might be critical of, of Israel on the air. And Mehdi, I just think, you know, crossed enough of those lines that someone said, OK, we've had enough of this, um, of, a, of a guy who's giving, you know, token appreciation to the Palestinian cause. Uh, and it's just, it's been too much. And so it shouldn't come as any surprise to us, I think, because because, you know, this is uh, a very long standing uh, unspoken tenet uh, of the U.S. kind of mainstream media world, which is you just don't do that. You just don't call bullshit um, on, on the Zionists and you don't speak too loudly on the behalf of the Palestinian cause. And of course, now that we're seeing uh, this new round of violence take its uh, vicious and visible toll in, in Palestine, the grip 
those organizations is only going to strengthen. Now, it can strengthen in a productive way. So there's more tension, you know, the distance between where the U.S. public is and where that elite consensus that's so dominated by the Zionist lobby is, is growing by the day. But we should expect those talents to be even stronger as they kind of grip on to uh, a, 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 the, the institutions to which they hope to, that we hope to influence as they lo- begin to lose their grip over public opinion. And I mean, obviously, this will have an effect beyond just the actual people who are taken off air, right? So if, if someone as, as, as famous as Mehdi Hassan can be taken off air, I mean, as we say, we, we can't confirm the precise reasons, but it does seem like a bit of a coincidence if it is during um, the Israeli bombardment of Gaza that probably the most critical person of Israeli policy has been taken off mainstream television. Obviously, there was also that story actually immediately after October the 7th where MSNBC took a number of Muslim hosts off air. So they're not being exactly subtle about this. And as I say, this has an effect on directly on people like Mehdi Hassan, and that will reduce the the quality hosting we see on that platform. It's also going to have a terrifying effect for everyone else. You know, if if you were considering, is it worth me putting my neck out to to criticize Israel? If you've just seen someone that high profile lose their job, you're going to think twice, aren't you? Exactly the same when it comes to politicians. If you're seeing um, Rashida Tlaib having, you know, people being offered multi-million dollar bribes, essentially, to to stand against her. If you're weighing up whether or not to put out that tweet criticizing Israel or whether or not to ask that question in, 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 a, in a select committee um, to, that's critical of Israel or that sort of points to the truth of what's really going on, you're going to say, well, you know, if it, if it could happen to those really high profile people, what would happen to me? What would happen to me, right? It's just, it puts this completely chilling effect throughout American society. And I know people who work in entertainment in, in, in the US and they are terrified of speaking about, about this stuff, right? Because they see that people are losing their jobs and their careers. And that's a, you know, a very helpful way, isn't it? Of reducing criticism for something, make everyone terrified. They can lose it. You don't have to bother with argument and reason and debate. You don't even have to bother with sort of producing propaganda because you can just fire anyone who criticizes you. Very, very authoritarian. We've got a video premiering on our channel this weekend. It's an exclusive behind the scenes. Look at how downstream is made. Um, Ash and Aaron talk about how the show uh, got started and what they have planned for 2024. The video will be available on our channel from 3 p.m. on Sunday. There's a link in the description below.